She's one of the highest profile executives working in Silicon Valley, the daughter of an Indian doctor who encouraged her to take risks. I would say that my father was far more forward thinking than I was. I mean, you know, he was buying AOL as a 70 year old man. She ran Google's operations in the Asia Pacific, overseeing the company's relationship with China. And now she's heading a new venture. Can Sukinder Singh Cassidy revolutionize the world of online shopping? And how does she view e-commerce in Asia? We'll ask her next on Conversation With, U.S. election special. Hello from San Francisco, I'm Simon Marks. $1.25 trillion, that's the amount of money we are all forecast to spend next year on the internet. E-commerce, what most of us simply call online shopping. And while companies like eBay, Amazon.com and Zappos have transformed the face of American retailing and performed strongly overseas, the real growth in online shopping is taking place in Asia. China alone saw online sales grow 130% last year and is on course to become the world's single largest online market. It is then a brave woman who looks at the world of online shopping and decides that it's prime for a revolution. And her story begins on the other side of the world. You have, in every sense of the phrase, traveled a very long way to get here. My parents actually originally uh, were settled in Tanzania, and that's where I was born, in East Africa. Uh, somewhere around two, they decided they wanted to give their children a better education and immigrated to Canada, and I spent most of my time growing up there. Uh, right after college, I went to New York uh, and tried my hand at investment banking, and then moved over to London to continue working for Merrill Lynch, and ultimately moved uh, into my first foray in media with B Sky B. Somewhere around 96, 97, I got very restless as a youth and, um, and wanted to do something entrepreneurial, but I had no idea what it was. And a friend of mine, a very good friend, was going to Stanford Business School in California, and I went out to visit her and fe fell in love with the valley. It is easy to understand why Sukinda Singh Cassidy fell in love with Silicon Valley. In the late 1990s, it was on fire. Fortunes were being made and sometimes lost. And for a young woman finding her feet in business, it was the place to be. What I remember of my childhood that anchored me in entrepreneurship was a father who loved running his own business. So my father was a doctor, but he absolutely loved running medical practice. And when I was, I mean, as young as probably nine or 10, I was doing his bookkeeping. You know, at 11 or 12, I was helping him do his tax returns. I remember him at 70 years old with a magnifying glass, literally le reading his stock quotes and calling up his broker by phone and saying, hey, Tom, should we buy some AOL? I mean, this is a memory of, I have from my childhood. So he was sort of a, a, a doctor and a humanitarian, but he loved business and he loved running his own business. And so I think that's what I remember of my childhood. And then I think as I grew up and went to be, wanted to be an investment banker and, um, and went to undergrad business school, honestly, I was sort of enraptured by the thought of being an executive, even though I had no idea what it meant. How early did you start saying, there's this tech industry and there's this stuff going on in Silicon Valley and actually this could be, this is, this is not, um, this is not a trial run. This could be the real deal in terms of transforming the you know, I, I would say that my father was far more forward thinking than I was. I mean, you know, he was buying AOL as a 70 year old man in, you know, the early 1990s, and I was still thinking investment banking, media, what have you. So actually, I can't claim any credit. I think, I think what I do feel is, you know, I've always been a risk taker. And when I was at Sky and yearning to start a company, and went out to visit, visit uh, my friend in Silicon Valley, I would call it serendipity. You know, I arrived here and I felt something, right? And so even though I was only out here for two or three weeks, I was at, you know, she was an undergrad at Stanford Business School and I saw the energy and the lifestyle. And so I think that's when I would say that it hit me that there was something really unique going on here. I think that people claim too much credit for having foresight. I think a lot of great careers are built on intuition and a sense of needing to go somewhere and not being sure exactly where it is and a willingness to explore that. For those of us who don't live here and don't come here very often, mm -hmm. this is a part of the world that has transformed itself again and again and again mm -hmm. 
in an incredibly short space of time. Mm -hmm. What you see is just a tremendous amount of intellectual horsepower applied to highly improbable tasks and getting rewarded for it. And this is what I mean about risk tolerance, right? You know, it's one thing when you are in a corporate environment and thinking about, gosh, you know, should I switch jobs? It's another thing when you arrive in an environment where that, with the notion that you can try something audacious and it's okay to fail, is completely supported. In fact, all you see everywhere you go is people doing it. And if, you, if you're not doing it, you sort of feel like you're, you're behind the eight ball. So I think, I think what it is, it just provides a support system you know, in a sense that like wanting to be audacious is okay. Wanting to try something that, you know, most probably will fail is okay. And by the way, there's an infrastructure to do here, to do it here, that is actually, you know, I think incredibly supportive and in many ways less risky for an entrepreneur. I mean, let's think about the entrepreneur who lives in New Jersey and mortgages his house to start a business. And you think about coming here where all around you, you're in an environment where it's supported and there is a capital, you know, a capital support system that makes it okay to fail. I mean, you can start a company and get a salary, and if you fail, it's okay. Where else in the world does that happen? That, of course, is in stark contrast to some of the other things going on economically in California, a state that is facing a $16 billion budget deficit and massive cuts in public spending that are already laying the public education system low and threatening the most vulnerable members of society. And let me ask you how that coexists with a California uh -huh. that is facing a monumental budget crisis, uh, that is implementing all sorts of public expenditure cuts, mm -hmm. and, and yet you have, right in the center of, of this particular Bay Area, mm -hmm. this kind of pulsating heart of American innovation. How do those two things coexist? You know, I think what I would say is this. You have the heart of capitalism, right, in Sil Silicon Valley, and the sense that if you turned things over to the private sector, right, a lot of problems could get solved with, you know, with an entrepreneurial uh, spirit um, and a release from the confines of having to do it a certain way. But that exists in a macro environment and a political system that at the end of the day is not really today about finding the best solution. It's, you know, it's driven by partisanship. So I think it's a tough coexistence, actually. Um, but what I'm encouraged by, I feel like, is the number of my colleagues who, despite that, say, we want to take what we've learned and go make a difference. You know, and I think that that's been a positive lesson. I mean, Meg Whitman didn't need to run for governor, right? She chose to because she felt like she had a skill set that could be of use to California. And whether she won or not, I credit that decision. Right? It's a bold one. Still to come, running Asia-Pacific operations for Google and the lessons learned. Stay with us for more of Conversation With, U.S. Selection Special. Things in this part of the world move fast. Just a few years ago, you could have driven out to Silicon Valley and not found much of anything there. Today, you find the headquarters of Google, Facebook and Twitter, global brands that some say have superpower aspirations. And that means a lot of internet pioneers have learned a lot about the world in a very short space of time. I wish I could tell you that I had the foresight that Google was going to end up being as big a company as it was. What I understood about Google was this. I was, an, I was a young entrepreneur starting a company called Yodely with four engineers. Yodely was going nicely, but Google seemed to be going a little bit better. Yodely pioneered technology solutions in the banking sector and, to be fair, is no Silicon Valley failure. But after founding it, Sukinda Singh Cassidy was approached by an investor who had bankrolled her and helped Google secure startup capital. And he made her an enticing proposition. Google needs to figure out how to build a business and local on maps. And Yahoo has this thing called Yahoo Maps. And the Yellow Page companies are calling us. We don't know what to do. This is a greenfield opportunity. And then I stepped back and I spent, and I came in and talked to the folks at Google, and I spent a weekend researching the Yellow Pages market and the Maps market. And I think within two weeks, I'd said yes to Google because I was like, holy smokes. I could go build a small company or I could go build something like Local and Maps at Google. And wouldn't that be pretty amazing? Good old Yellow Pages. It's hard to remember now, but just a few years ago, the phone book known as the Yellow Pages was the place people went to connect with local businesses. Google Maps changed all that, and Sukinder Singh Cassidy oversaw the changing. And that's something that 
was transformational at the time. Yeah, I mean, you know, I feel really proud of the fact that Google Local and Maps today is, is, is you're right, a transformational service, both on the mobile phone and on the desktop, certainly, um, that has changed the way people, you know, you know move through the world. Um, but again, I can't credit myself with saying, ah, I have to be at Google. It was rather, you know, here's this common connection, a shared investor, a shared set of DNA, you know, among founders of two different companies, uh, a sense that Google's heading in a direction that maybe is too big, and one day they call me up. And I think this is the magic of the valley, that even in a company like Google, right, there's always the opportunity to create new things, right, and to foster new things. And, the, and so the opportunity to be an entrepreneur inside of Google, you know, was, was really transformational for me in a way I didn't expect. Transformational because Google didn't just want to map the world, they wanted to expand into it. And Sukinder Singh Cassidy was the woman Google's founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, selected to head their operations in Latin America and the Asia Pacific. When I think about international, what I remember from Larry and Sergey, somewhere around 2003, or late 2003, early 2004, before they asked me to step into the role of, of driving it, was that Larry and Sergey wanted us to be international all at once everywhere. And so a mandate came down from Larry and Sergey. It's like, look, we need to be everywhere all at once. And then all of a sudden, you know, it was all guns blazing. But there must have been countries that were looking at Google with questions, concerns. Yeah. How did you deal with that? You know, I think, I, I'm, I'm sure one of the countries you're referring to is China. And certainly one of the biggest decisions we made very, I think I, think I accepted the job uh, to drive Asia, Pacific, and Latin America in, in October of 2003. And I think by January 2004, we were having an all-hands meeting at the company talking about our decision after China. And before that, we went to the board. We presented a game plan. I went and visited Shanghai. We went to Beijing. And, and so, you know, on the, on the one hand, you would say it was difficult. But on the other hand, I would say this was always, I think, the benefit of, of our, our decision to enter China. I mean, the Chinese people, and I think even the Chinese government, you know, would have wanted to see Google participate in China. There might be questions about how they wanted us to participate. But, you know, if you just step back and looked at it from the lens of, is it better to have more information flow in China? And is it better for Chinese people to have access to all the world's information from more than one source, Baidu? Is that a good thing? You know, and I think both for the government and for Google, the answer was yes, right? And we found a way to operate in their system and with their values and with our own values. But if you just step back and say, over the long term, what should, a, what should an American company's policy on China be? I generally am a believer in an engagement strategy, right? Because I, I think that these are not things that get worked out over you know, a month or a year or even five years. These are, these are relationships you know, and movements that span decades, right? So I think that Google has always been a company that's taken a long-term view to what it wants to be in the world, right? And made decisions for shareholders over the long term. I continue to believe that not just for Google, but for everyone, right? The notion of how do you participate in China? Do you participate with, you know, from, a, uh, from a system of what you would think of as resistance or from a system of engagement? And I, I, my overall philosophy that you know, long-term engagement with China is good. Still to come, transforming the face of e-commerce, one video at a time. Stay with us for more of Conversation With. I wonder where you're watching this. Are you sitting in front of a television with a big screen and a crystal clear picture? I kind of hope so. Maybe you're watching it on an iPad or a smartphone. Did someone send you a link to it on YouTube or Facebook? There are so many ways to watch video these days. And Sukinder Singh Cassidy thinks that when you go online shopping, you'd like to watch it too. I found a cleansing oil that removes heavy makeup, dissolves waterproof mascara, and takes off dirt and oil all without clogging your pores. This is not your common or garden television shopping experience. This is Joyous, Sukinder Singh Cassidy's new business, an example of the third iteration of the internet, what she calls the Web 3.0. Read Auto, I think, is all about how do you drive discovery online? How do you bring those categories online that are not about knowing that you want to get a book by a certain author or you know, an electronic gadget or book a ticket online? And I think this is the rise of the flash sale. 
the subscription commerce businesses we see today, like Birchbox, which are all about sending you a sample of goods so you can try a bunch of beauty products. And Joyous, I think, is yet the, the next wave of this. And when I look at Joyous, I say to myself, hmm, what if we could really take the experience that you have when you physically shop and bring it online and solve, solve all those problems that are still the last mile of commerce? What if I could show you a pair of jeans you know, on video and tell you why they're such a great fit? Isn't that a better experience than a still image? And so I think of a premium commerce experience today as one that solves the problem of discovery, that helps shift the consumer online by solving the problems that online has not yet solved. You know, and we think that video is an essential, essential part of that equation and the next wave of commerce. But there are those people who will say there are no shortage of video channels, classic television channels, mm -hmm. specializing in retailing. Mm -hmm. uh, and many of them are now putting video online. Yep. What, what's the gap in the market there that you're trying to fill? People don't consume online video the same way they watch television. Uh, and let me give you a, a really good example. On online, you're lucky if you get somebody's attention for 30 seconds. If you got it for a minute, you're doing great. If you got it for two minutes, awesome. So I think online video is a different kind of video. I think and the online consumer is a different kind of consumer of content. Some paradigms hold over and some do not. And so when we started Joyce, we said, look, it doesn't work to take TV content and put it online for shopping. Like, you don't have an hour of somebody's time. You can't repetitively show them the same seven-minute segment four times in a row and not have them get frustrated with you. You can't force them to watch live if they don't want to, right? So if you took all those trends into account, what would you create? You know, archetype for this consumer a brand new experience, take some of the old par paradigms at work, throw out those that don't, and you'll end up with something that looks like joyous. And presumably you cannot only be doing this as a destination website. You've got to get the word out through a variety of partnerships with manufacturers, with retailers, and other Absolutely. organizations. That is, the, that is the other beauty of the internet, right? That you have the opportunity to create a whole ecosystem around you, right? So with joyous, that that's, comes from the most simple thing, which is having a blogger in a video who then takes our video that she's in, embeds it on her website, her users watch it, they drive traffic to joyous, right? That's a partnership that's both technology and content-based. It doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. When you look at e-commerce in China, in India, in other parts of the Asia-Pacific, the, the, the projected growth rates are obviously enormous. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you assess the state of the e-commerce industry and its attendant supportive mm -hmm. industries in, in that countries. part of the world? So I think a couple of things. I think as you, as you can probably appreciate, even more than media, e-commerce is driven not only by um, online consumption and concerns about, and the supportive payment systems, security, you know, um, those things, that, that infrastructure needs to be there. But the other thing needs to be there is physical logistics and infrastructure. You know, I think what I credit China with is amazing infrastructure, you know, to support an e-commerce, you know, an e-commerce system. The ability to get a package locally in a village in China, the ability to pay, you know, in a, uh, in a local currency, the reseller networks in China, right? I mean, how do you reach a Chinese population? Services like Ads, AdWords were sold through resellers, right? Like literally physical people out in the region who could explain to you what AdWords was. I just think that China has a tremendous amount of infrastructure to support these things. India will get there, but I think one of the things India has to contend with is in some ways a lack of infrastructure still. Despite the Indian entrepreneur, there is a lack of physical infrastructure. I mean, and just reliability to the mail system, to the you know, to the physical infrastructure in the country, and things like electricity, <laughs> you know, that make it I think a little bit more difficult to count on getting a package quickly, you know. But I think India will solve that. I mean, it's got the one of the world's largest labor forces. There are many ways to get somebody a package if they buy it online. Um, and I certainly think the Indian entrepreneur is going to figure that out, despite the infrastructure, some of the infrastructure challenges in the country. And let me finally ask you a kind of a geostrategic question. You're doing this at a time when many people argue the United States on an international scale economically is losing its way. China's approaching rapidly in its rearview mirror. India, Brazil, many of these countries with which you've had so much experience in the past. Where do you see that narrative going? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. So um, clearly, and let me, I, I have I very strong biases. As somebody who was Canadian, right, who made my way into the United States on an extraordinary person's visa, <laughs> right, after years and years of worrying whether my H-1B would get renewed, right, and having my husband, who's also Canadian, get his green card only by marrying me, you know, at the right time as I was about to get mine. I mean, these were all strategies we had for staying in this country, right? And now I'm a bit, I, I have the ability, I think, to give back, right, by creating a company that creates jobs and creates um, 
you know, economic growth for the, com for the country and for consumers. But my frustration is exactly this. I think that at this point, the United States needs to have as open an immigration policy as is, as is humanly possible if it wants to compete with Brazil and China and India. Because as you pointed out, I've spent all my time there with those entrepreneurs. And you know what? They are damn smart <laughs> and damn motivated. And I think the United States would be lucky to have them. And today, they still want to come. But it's getting increasingly hard right, to be here and stay here and start a company here. What, in, what inevitably happens is you come over to do your PhD. And we, you know, the United States trains some of the best people in the world at the graduate level. And then it's so difficult for you to stay that you go back. And instead of exercising your entrepreneurial ambition here in Silicon Valley, you go and exercise it in China. And so again, when you think about engagement policies, this is one of, you know, immigration is another area where I feel like we need to have a very strong engagement policy. But so does that make you worry that this country is losing its way? Um, I guess I am at the end of the day an optimist over the long term and a pessimist over the short term. So to answer your question, in the short term, am I worried? Yes. In the long term, do I still retain optimism that we'll figure this out? Yes. <laughs> um, does it need to get figured out? Yes. So in the arc of your personal story, what comes next? So interestingly, I hope there's nothing next after Joyous. I mean, I really hope that, you know, the last 20 years were about proving that I had the right to make the choices I want to make and that I could succeed at, at different tasks. I don't have anything to prove success-wise. Now I think what I owe to myself is the ability to for lack of a better word, do what's on my bucket list, which is what if I could architect something that exercised both my personal passions, my creative passions, my executive ambitions, and create something impactful for the world in a way that's personal to me. And I love the idea of delighting women. I love the idea of creating a technology and creative-based company you know, that makes women feel a little more special every day. And I just feel like at this point in my life, there is no next thing. I'm enjoying the ability to have made this choice, which is awesome. Joyous is not without its competitors. As long ago as 1982, two Florida businessmen started a television channel called The Home Shopping Club. It was then a revolutionary concept, and it led to the TV shopping channels that today tell us we've simply got to have that electric can opener, that brand new stain remover, and a lovely set of pearl earrings. But Sakinda Singh Cassidy believes that she is blazing a trail for a new kind of online shopping experience and she's putting her considerable reputation in the high-tech industry on the line in a bid to prove it. I'm Simon Marks from San Francisco. Goodbye. <laughs>